You've heard of Captain Jack Sparrow, the notorious Blackbeard, Long John Silver, and of course Calico Jack, but only basic pirates take their booty at sea. Today on Nutty History, we're covering the real-life bootstrapping sky pirate, D.B. Cooper, and how this mysterious man managed to jump off a commercial airplane with $200,000. Please take a moment to fasten your seatbelts and mentally prepare for a lot of unnecessary pirate references. Shiver my timbers! In November of 1971, passengers aboard a Northwest Orient Airlines flight from Portland to Seattle were alerted over the PA system that their arrival would be delayed as the plane was experiencing a minor technical difficulty. They calmly resumed their boozing and reading, or whatever it was people did on planes in the 70s. If they'd looked out the window, they would have noticed the plane continue to circle the Seattle airport for two hours on what was only supposed to be a 30-minute flight. The passengers had been duped. The real story was much more alarming. Just as the plane took off, a flight attendant named Florence Schaffner was handed a note from a middle-aged man in a suit drinking a bourbon and soda. Assuming the passenger was hitting on her, she tucked the note away without bothering to read it, but the customer insisted, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. After Florence sat next to the man and found that his suitcase did contain what appeared to be an explosive of some kind, the passenger, who'd used the alias Dan Cooper, relayed his ransom demands. $200,000, that's over $1.2 million today, four parachutes, and a truck ready to refuel the plane in Seattle. The pilots, who were probably quaking in their boots, communicated the situation to air traffic control. As the police and FBI prepared the ransom demands, the plane continued to circle. Batten down the hatches! The flight attendants kept a watchful eye on Cooper, who they described as actually pretty pleasant and even kind of nice. He ordered another drink, cool as a cucumber, and attempted to tip the flight attendant when paying his tab. That ought to make up for bringing a bomb into her workplace. He even offered to request meals for the crew during their coerced pit stop in Seattle. Something about a near-death experience probably curbs the appetite. After landing in Seattle, the money and parachutes were brought on board, and the passengers, who finally realized something was going down, disembarked. All that remained on the plane with Cooper were the two pilots, a flight engineer, and one flight attendant, who evidently drew the short straw. The number of parachutes requested, four, had everyone concerned that he intended to force his hostages to jump ship, or rather plane, with him. During the refuel, Cooper instructed the crew on his plan. The plane was to head to Mexico City, with specifications requiring that the plane go minimal speed, with lowered wing flaps, and a depressurized cabin. Another refueling stop was necessary, and Reno, Nevada, was agreed upon. The flight took off, with the crew instructed to stay in the cockpit with the door closed. About 20 minutes later, the crew received a notification that the aircraft air stairs were activated. It was time for Cooper to walk the plank, so to speak. Shortly thereafter, the crew heard a large thump and presumed Cooper had jumped from the plane. After arriving in Reno, a search ensued, and it was confirmed D.B. Cooper had vanished into thin air. He took the money and jumped, in what would become the only unsolved case of commercial air piracy in history. The FBI conducted an exhaustive search effort of D.B. Cooper's suspected landing zone, but it's probably not surprising that pinpointing the exact location a man landed while parachuting out of a moving plane was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Cooper also jumped on a windy, rainy night, which made his fall point that much harder to track. Despite aerial and foot searches, the FBI found zero evidence of Cooper or his equipment. The FBI party line is that there's no way that D.B. Cooper could have survived the jump. With the weather conditions and the lack of proper equipment, there's doubt he would have even been able to open the parachute. But other case studies have theorized there's a good chance he could have survived the jump and planned a way out of the rugged northwest wilderness ahead of time. The fact that no trace has been found lends some credence to the Cooper Lived team. But later investigations found that the initial calculations of Cooper's landing area were flawed, meaning that the FBI might have been searching in the wrong area the whole time. Oh yeah, the FBI and Northwest Orient Airlines didn't forget about the 200 grand that Cooper had taken on his way out. Like everything else in this mind-melting case, nothing about the money makes sense. Initially, the FBI gave out the serial numbers of the Cooper money to large cash handlers like casinos and banks, to no avail. Eventually, the serial numbers were released to the public, offering substantial monetary rewards to anyone who could produce bills from the heist. Still, no money turned up. That is, 
Until one day, nine years later, an eight-year-old boy on vacation with his family was building a campfire on a beachfront of the Columbia River known as Tina Bar. Buried in the sand, he discovered three packets of disintegrated ransom money, totaling about $3,000. At first, the answer seemed simple. The bills had washed into Tina Bar from a tributary near Cooper's landing site. But on further analysis, it didn't add up. Ten bills were missing from one of the packets, and it didn't make sense that this portion of the money would end up separated from the rest. Furthermore, geological studies of the sand and sediment showed that the money couldn't have ended up there until well past 1974, three years after the hijacking and long after it would have floated there on its own. If someone put the money there after 1974, was Cooper alive the whole time? Did someone else discover and later rebury the loot? But why only $3,000 of it? Sorry, I don't actually know any of these answers. Just trying to avoid pulling my own hair out. Yeah, wouldn't we all like to know? One of the most fascinating elements of the D.B. Cooper mystery is how little we know about his actual identity. Despite a decades-long FBI investigation, the suspects and theories are just as vast and varied as they were 50 years ago. Based on Cooper's demands and comments on board the 727, the FBI suspected he had knowledge of the Washington area, as well as aircraft operations, and thought that he was possibly an Air Force veteran. His startlingly specific knowledge of the particular plane, though, led to the idea that he worked for Boeing, or was even part of a CIA paramilitary unit. Boeing layoffs and the bad economy around this time supported the idea that Cooper could be a disgruntled and financially desperate employee. It also led to his hero status for sticking it to the man and getting one over on the FB friggin' eye. Composite sketches of Cooper show a pretty basic-looking white guy, which led everyone and their mother to decide they knew who the real D.B. Cooper was. Many reported relatives with weird amounts of money and strange deathbed confessions. One often suggested suspect is Richard Floyd McCoy Jr., the culprit behind a post-Cooper copycat hijacking. He was caught for this one, escaped jail, and was later killed in a shootout. But supporters of this theory think that the real McCoy was D.B. Cooper, who made a second attempt after losing the money in the plane jump. Alas, dead men tell no tales. Other notable proposed suspects include Barbara Dayton, a trans female pilot who, according to her friends, dressed as the male D.B. Cooper and confessed her role to them. Walter Recker, a military vet and parachuter, was seen the night of Cooper's jump walking near a possible landing site looking like a drowned rat. He also confessed. Or there's Dwayne Webber, whose wife alleges he told her his secret identity before he died, and who took a mysterious trip to the Tina Bar area just four months before the ransom money was found. A big factor that made believers think Cooper made it out alive is that there were no suspicious people reported missing. Presumably, if Cooper were a local who worked in one of the suspected fields and died, the FBI would have zoomed in on the person who didn't return to work the next week. But everyone did. So what do you think, mateys? Did this badass pirate of the skies live a long life counting all those doubloons he couldn't safely spend? Or was this a stunt so ratchet it was suicidal? Let us know your theories in the comments. And check out our other videos for more legendary content.